Welcome back to chapter seven of The Bungee Venture by Stan McMurtry. And we're just in the second part of chapter seven. If you remember, Bungie, the creature that they'd met, uh, this weird creature that wasn't in the history books, had seen them in the pterodactyl's nest and had just rescued them from the nest. They grabbed onto the back of his orange hair and he'd, uh, he'd flown gently down with his inflated trunk above him, a little bit like a balloon, and they'd landed on the floor safely. And they just asked him what was his name and he'd said, Eep, Eep, I'm a bungee. It said its head bobbing up and down enthusiastically. Now, there are some words up here and these are the words that Bungie says. So I'll leave you to look at those more closely if you want, but I'll carry on with the story. I'm the best Bungie in the whole world. A Bungie, said Andy. What a lovely name. Are there any other bungees near here? No, I'm the only bungee in a world, it said. But there must be other bungees, said Carrie. You must have a mother or a father or sisters or brothers. They can't be just the one. The bungee suddenly looked terribly sad. Its little bottom lip trembled slightly and a tear trickled from its eye and down its trunk. My mummy got eaten by a Tyrannosaurus. Oh, said the children sympathetically. My daddy blew himself up till he bust. Oh, my sister had too many eggs. Oh, and all the rest got the measles and died. Oh, what a shame, said cried Karen. All your relations gone like that. No wonder they're not in the history books, she whispered to Andy. Or will you excuse us a moment, Mr. Bungie? Andy croaked. If we don't have a drink soon, I'm going to dry up completely. He waded quickly into the pool of water, which was near to where he'd landed. It felt so deliciously cool that he threw his arms up happily and let himself sprawl forward onto his face with a splash. Karen joined him and the Bungie stood on the bank with a slightly puzzled expression as they drank and splashed and wallowed happily. At least 10 minutes later, 10 minutes went by before it said, don't you care about the pranas? Pardon, said Karen, standing up waist deep in the water. The pranas, the bungee repeated. Andy looked at his sister puzzled. What does he mean, pranas? Karen said, you don't mean piranhas? Eep, eep, that's what I said, the bungee nodded. Piranhas? One second later, the children stood dripping beside the bungee on the bank and staring back horrified at the water. It had only been a week ago that they'd been learning all about piranhas in school, how a shoal of the deadly little fish could strip a carcass to the bone in seconds, just to eat you alive. Karen shuddered. Well, why didn't you tell us? She asked, she asked. Nobody asked me, said the bungee. Andy sat down with the squelch on the grass. Everything is so dangerous in this age, he moaned. I don't think we'll ever find dad and get out of here alive. He looked up forlornly at the other two. We've been lucky so far nearly trampled on by something as soon as we arrived here, then picked up by a pterodactyl, rescued by dear old Bungie here, and now just missing death by a hair's breadth in a piranha-infested river. He stared down at his feet in exasperation. I haven't a clue what to do or where to look next. The Bungie nudged Karen with the end of his trunk. Hey, said what am I with him? Karen smiled apologetically at Bungie. I I'm sorry, she said. You must think we're terribly rude. Perhaps we ought to put you completely in the picture and tell you the whole story. So Bungie licked his feet and stuck himself sideways onto a large boulder where he was, said he was most comfortable. And Karen and Andy squatted below 
their clothes steaming dry in the hot sunshine as they started to relate their story. Speaking as slowly as they could, trying not to use too many long words, they told him all about their father's inventions and the time machine going wrong and how they'd built another one. How they'd seen their father at the Gruyere cheese, that holy cheese, looking desert. Of the pterodactyl picking them up and the fight with the eggs. When they'd finished, Bungie licked his feet again and started plodding around the side of the boulder thoughtfully. The little lips pursed and he whistled in a tuneless way. His brow creased in concentration and his feet yucked hollowly with every step. At last he stopped and looked down at the children. They looked up at him expectantly. Well, they said in unison. The bungee puffed himself up and took a deep breath and as though he was going to start a long lecture and said, I'm hungry. Oh, that's a fat lot of help, said Andy crossly. Can't think on an empty stomach, said Bungie. Ah, hungry too, well, Karen. Bungie, where can we find some food? And then she added, and I don't mean pterodactyl's eggs. Fruit, asked Bungie. Fruit would be super, said Karen. Without another word, Bungie unplugged himself from the boulder, walked across the river bank and hopped sideways onto the cliff face where he ambled slowly along about two meters from the ground while the children followed on the ground in silence. After about an hour's walking they'd only covered a distance of about a mile. The bungee was infuriatingly slow and several times the children wandered on ahead and sat on a rock until he caught up. Eventually however after following the meandering line of the cliff for another half an hour, they turned a corner and were confronted by a wall of dense shrubbery. The trees were small and stunted with branches that were gnarled and twisted, but from the thick foliage hung a dazzling variety of the most succulent fruit the children had ever seen. Great clusters of purple pear shaped fruit hung from sharply spiked branches on one tree, while from another, brilliant yellow flowers spurted like small fountains from the sides of massive green globes that gushed sweet, sticky juice when bitten into. Here and there, the children could see more familiar fruits, apples, oranges, and large yellow plums. But everything here was on a much larger scale, and most of the plants were strange and unfamiliar to the children's eyes. It was some time since the children had eaten, and so they set off with a will, stuffing great handfuls of fruit into their mouths, working from tree to tree, experiencing each time a new taste, calling to each other through overloaded mouths. Hey, well, come and try this one, it's super. Or, look at the colour of this one, isn't it beautiful? The, bu the bungee, meanwhile, plodded slowly up the cliff towards a nest that he'd spotted high above the trees. He stopped occasionally and looked back protectively at the children down below. Strange creatures, he thought. Fancy eating fruit. He licked his feet and climbed a bit higher. Eggs is much nicer. He felt strangely happy. For the first time since his last relative died, he'd actually spoken to another living thing. He tried mimicking him, picking up the language of other creatures, but it was useless. None of the other animals could think. His earnest attempts at conversation had always been met with blank stares or grunts. It had been beyond his wildest dreams that there could be another type of animal, another species that he could learn to have a sti stimulating conversation with. But here were these two strange creatures who had come from heaven knows where and some other time and they could actually think like he did. It was marvellous. Admittedly, they did speak a little bit slowly with those strange gaps between words, but given time and a good elocution teacher like Bungie, they'd soon learn to speed up. 
he hummed a little tune to himself and edged nearer to the nest, wondering as he did so how he could help his newfound friends. Well, down below in the prehistoric orchard, the children had almost eaten their fill. They lay on their backs at the foot of a tree and watched through half-closed eyes as the bungee, at the bungee high above on the cliff. Andy threw the core of a green, melon-sized apple into the long grass. That was the best meal I think I've ever had, he murmured. Me too, said Karen. What a pity they don't have fruit like that in the 20th century. Mm -mm. Which fruit did you like best? Oh, the juicy blue one, said Karen. Definitely the, the blue ones. I have never tasted anything so delicious. And they lay contentedly for a moment or two, saying nothing. Somewhere to the right of them, a bird squawked and the little dot upon the cliff that was bungee picked up an egg from the nest with its trunk and popped it into its mouth. It was cool for them under the heavy green branches and the feast had made them feel drowsy. Andy shut his eyes and fell asleep. Karen plucked a long stem of grass and chewed at the cool yellow end. She, was, she too closed her eyes and having done so missed by a fraction of a second the sudden movement in the foliage behind her. This sudden movement came from a plant which was slightly taller than the rest of the bushes around. The children had ignored it when they were eating because it didn't appear to have any edible fruit. Perhaps another reason was because it was an extremely ugly plant compared to the others. It was shaped like the trumpet part of a daffodil, but about two and a half, three meters tall and dark green in color. No leaves, no stem, no fruit, just a plain dark green trumpet sticking solidly out of the ground and pointing its open end up at the sky. At least this is how it looked when the children had been awake. Now a change was taking place. From the centre of the trumpet there arose six glistening black tendrils. On the end of each tendril was a brown leathery pod they climbed slowly out of the main stem of the plant like monstrous worms. With a soft popping noise, the pods burst open and from the centre of each pod cascaded a mass of sticky white tubes which writhed like living spaghetti, spaghetti through the grass towards the sleeping children. The first sticky tube fastened itself tightly around Karen's ankle. She woke immediately, but her horrified scream was cut off by another white worm, which flopped revoltingly across her mouth. She struggled violently, but another fat white tube pinned her arms to her sides, another wound around her legs, and soon she was wrapped in an, enorm an enormous cocoon of white stickiness, which squeezed her in such a tight grip, she could hardly breathe. The tubes were quickly pulled down towards the leathery pod and Karen was lifted high into the air until she could look down into the hollow trumpet of the plant. She caught a glimpse below of dark red hairs growing wetly from the sides of the inside of the trumpet with a black pit at the bottom like an open throat and then a grotesque sucking noise, she felt herself being pulled down into the darkness. We'll have to see what happens next. That's the end of chapter seven. Surely Bungie will save them, providing Bungie can see them. <laughs>